priest. I am not the pastor of this church. Do not expect too much. And don't be discouraged. And still in the process of uh, learning. As our topic for today is uh, Lordship over creatures. So we, I look on the definition of, of creature. It, it, it describes everything which is uh, created. It refers to the uh, entire creation. Every being beside the creator or everything that's not self-existent. The sun, the moon, the stars, the earth and the animals, plants, light, darkness, air, water, and etc. Those are all the creatures, creatures of God. But in restricted sense, uh, it refers to an animal of any kind, a living, be a living being or a beast. And in a more restricted sense, it refers to a man. And the term Lord, as in the Lordship over creatures, the term Lord is defined as a man of renowned power or authority. So <clears throat> Jesus is Lord over all creation. Jesus has the ultimate authority, and it is for this reason he is referred to as the Lord of Lords. <clears throat> but the Lord, the Bible refers, is, uh, was the uh, Kyrios or Kyrios. It means my power, Lord, master, or owner. It's a uh, New Testament Greek uh, equivalent to the old Hebrews, Jehovah. And it appears to in the coin uh, Greek New Testament about 740 times and usually referring to Jesus. So in, in this sense, uh, we will talk about how Jesus shown his power, his authority through miracles in, in Matthew chapter chapter 8 and chapter 9. We'll just pick up those uh, nine miracles of Jesus and we will divide it into, into three sets. The first, the first set was the, uh, uh, his power over the disease. The second is his power over the natural, the supernatural and sin. And lastly, the, the third set was his power over death. And before we continue, let us bow our heads in prayer. Thank you, Father, for our time this afternoon. As your word will preach, touch our heart, our understanding that we may know you better and we may serve you better as we discuss the power of your sons over us creatures. May the Holy Spirit guide us and give us the wisdom and humbleness to accept your word. May your name be praised in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This we pray. Amen. So at creation, God ordained man uh, to be king of the earth, to rule over the, the peace of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over all the uh, cattle and over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. But when, <clears throat> when, man, when man fell into sin, he was dethroned and he lost his sovereignty over the earth. He lost his God-given majesty along with his innocence. With the rest of the earth, man was cursed and corrupted. He lost his dominion, and both man and earth lost their glory. The control of earth fell into the hands of Satan, who now reigned as ruler of this world and of this age. Man's sin, earth's corruption, and Satan's rule have brought sickness, pain, death, hardship, Sorrow, war, injustice, falsehood, hunger, natural disaster, demonic activity, and every other evil that plagues the world. But from the beginning, and even before the beginning, God planned the redemption of both man and, and the earth, reversing the curse. According to his divine plan, God's own son would come to earth twice in the process of that redemption. The first time to redeem man, and second time to redeem the earth. In his first coming, Jesus, Jesus Christ came in humility, going to the cross and rising from the grave 
to redeem man from sin. In his second coming, he will come in blazing glory and establish his thousand-year kingdom, the millennial kingdom, and after that, a completely new heaven and earth, redeeming the whole creation for all eternity. In the, in the coming kingdom of God, his ultimate plan for earth will be restored without sin, pain, disease, hatred, hardship, sorrow, disasters, or demons. There will be only holiness, righteousness, truth, peace, love, and beauty. Everything that now spoils man's happiness, that breaks his heart, <clears throat> that prostrates his soul, that disrupts and perverts his dominion, will be removed forever. <clears throat> For all time and eternity, the, un the universe will be redeemed. And as we look at, at mankind and, and the present earth, however, it, it is obvious that man himself could never affect such changes. Man cannot solve the natural problems of environment, weather, drought, famine, disease, and sickness. Someone has said the, that every problem science solves, six others are created in its place. The greater our advancement, the more severe the complications. Even less can man solve these moral and spiritual problems. As we become more advanced in psychology, sociology, criminology, and diplomacy, we also become more engulfed in psychological disorders, sociological dis uh, problems, and in crime and war. So, <clears throat> pasira na ng pasira ang mundo at ang tao ay pasama ng pasama. The power to reverse the curse and bring a new heaven and new earth not only is infinitely beyond man, but is inconceivable to man. We cannot imagine the power necessary to make such a radical recreation of the universe. Any more than we can imagine that the power to, to create it in the first place and to sustain it. Man has the capability to destroy his world, but not the power to perfect it. The psalmists tell us that the power belongs to God. He speaks of the greatness of thy power and of the one who does establish the mountains by his friend, being girded with might, David cried out, O God, thou art my God, I shall seek thee earnestly. My soul thirsts for thee, my flesh yearns for thee. In a dry and weary land where there is no water, thus I have beheld thee in the sanctuary to see thy power and thy glory. And even, even Paul reminds us, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made. So the more we search into the universe, the more amazing and awesome the wonder of creation becomes. Tele telescopes can take us some uh, 4 billion light years, about 25 sextillion miles into space, and yet we have not come near the edge of the universe. We have discovered certain gra gravitational principles that kept the stars and planets in their orbits. Yet, we are far from fully explaining those principles, much less of du duplicating them. The Earth spins on its axis at 8,000 miles an hour at the equator, travels in a 580 million mile orbit around the, Earth, around the Sun at about 1,000 miles a minute, and with the rest of its solar system, careens through space at an even faster speed in an orbit that would take a billion of years to complete. The energy of the sun has been estimated to be equivalent to 500 million million billion horsepower and there are at least 100,000 million other suns in the galaxy. Most of them is larger than ours. God is also creator and sustainer of the microcosm. A teaspoon of water contains a million billion trillion atoms which themselves are composed of still smaller particles of energy, smaller subparticles sub of those particles are still being discovered. So Hebrews 1, 3 says, Jesus Christ upholds all things by the word of his power. He energizes every atom and every atomic particle and subparticle 
in the universe. That is the power of God and Savior. He has the power to create and sustain the earth. Surely he has the power to recreate it. He has the power to bring back Eden and indeed create the new earth that far surpasses the Eden. So Jesus Christ came into the world in part to demonstrate the, that power, to show for all who would see it that he was indeed the Son of God. The promised Messiah and King had power to, to redeem man from sin and give him renewed sovereignty over a renewed earth. As noted in the previous chapter, uh, Matthew has already shown that Jesus has the right genealogy, the right birth, the right baptism, the right success over temptation, and the right message. God had said that the one who would reverse the curse would come to the line of David, and Jesus did. And God has said this deliverer was born of a virgin, and Jesus was. God had said he would be approved by the Father, and Jesus was. God had said he would be more powerful than Satan, and Jesus proved that he was. And God said his son would speak the truth, and Jesus did. God had said he would have the power over disease and death, and Jesus proved that he did. In the, in the Matthew, in chapter 8 and chapter 9, uh, there are nine miracles. <clears throat> the first three dealt with uh, disease, and the next three shows his, his power over the natural element, the supernatural world, and over sin. So we go from disease to the natural element, the supernatural dominion of demons, then sin, and later on, with the last three, he dealt with death. And all these are mar marvelous uh, pictures of his power. So we'll start with the first uh, set of miracles. His power over the, over the disease. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, let, uh, let us read. chapter 8 verse 1 to 17 when he came down from the mountain great crowd followed him, followed him and behold a leper came to him and knelt before him saying Lord if you will you can make me clean and Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying I will be clean and immediately his leprosy was cleansed and Jesus said to him, See that, that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. Verse 5, When he entered Capernaum, the centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to, to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled, and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, where the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Verse 14, And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother's, his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her, and the fever left her. And she rose and began to serve him. That evening they, they brought to him many who were, who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirit with the word and healed all who were sick. This was the people that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. 
he took our illness and bore our diseases. So what what when uh, what uh, can we see here? So first, it begins at the lowest level of human need, the the physical. Life is more than physical, yes, but Jesus is also sympathetic about the physical. It's wonderful that the miracles of Jesus were not only miracles that dealt with the spiritual things, but they do they, but they, that they touch man at the lowest level of their need, the physical. He goes to the depth of human disease. And second, he, he responds in all three cases to appeals. This shows us his compassion. In the first case, the leper says to him, if you will, you can make me clean. In the second case, the prince of the centurion says, the servant is in the house sick of paralysis. And he says, I'll come. And in the third case, according to what Luke adds, the parallel, uh, parallel passage in chapter 4, verse 38, and he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a, few fever, with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. In all three cases, he responds to, to the appeal of the heart of people. So third thing we can see is these three miracles is in every case he acts on his own will. Though he is sympathetic and and though he is at the same time deeply compassionate, he is also sovereign. In each case, he acts in his own volition. I will, I will be thou clean, and I will come down and heal him. He reached his hand and touched her, and the fever left. And fourthly, in each of these miracles, he touches someone who is in the term of the understanding of the Pharisees, and the Jews was the, the lowest level of human existence. So first, a leper, the scum of the earth, and second, the Gentile, and third, the woman. And you see where Jesus really put his emphasis on the humble, the meek, and the outcast. But uh, do we really understand what the uh, leprosy, or the leper that the Bible is talking about? So it's coming from the Greek word uh, lepros, uh, from the root word uh, lepis, which means scale or scaly. It's a, it's a skin visible disease, a scaly skin disease, and it could go much deeper uh, as the Leviticus uh, chapter 13 describes it. But uh, that's the term they use, uh, the lepros. So it, 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 it usually attacks the eyes and brings blindness. The teeth they pull out, it attacks the internal organs, so that the sternity occurs, and it's not that painful. It's just the most ugly thing imaginable in the world. It starts with a white or pink spot on the brows, the ear and the nose, the chin, or the cheek, and then it begins to spread, and it becomes spongy like tumor, swelling or all over the face. And then it becomes systemic, spread to the whole body, to the whole system. And that's when it begins to come to the liver and to the, to the bone marrow and the blood supply. You lose your, your feeling, it brings blindness. So lepers are uh, treated as dead men. But you know what was even beyond, beyond that? It wasn't that bad, or it, if it wasn't bad enough to be ugly beyond all imagination, to add to that, they were classified as ceremonial and clean. And God has a purpose. So leprosy was the most graphic illustration of sin available to God. So sin defines the whole body. Sin is ugly. Sin is disgusted. Sin is incurable. Sin is contaminating. Sin separates and alienates and, make, and makes outcasts of men. So every leper not only lived with the stigma of his own disease, but he lived with having to be a walking illustration of sin, ceremonially and clean. So wretched. So we move from the wretched man to the respected man. On verse 5, the centurion. Now, 
Here we find a man uh, who also would be, by the Jew, considered an outcast because he is a Gentile. Worse than, worse than that, he is a Roman, Roman soldier, a member of the occupation, occupation army that had invaded and occupied their precious land. This man in Capernaum was no doubt a soldier under the turf of Antipas. And he was not and if he was not a Jew living in the in this area, it, it is highly likely that he was a Samaritan. And it was bad to be a Gentile. The worst kind of Gentile was a Samaritan. Because a Samaritan was a Jew who had intermarried into Gentile lines, and that was to sacrifice his Jewish heritage the worst imaginable kind of Gentile, a breed. So normally he would hate it. He would be hated, close to a leper, but our Lord heals in his behalf. And again, what, what the Lord is saying is this. The extent of the kingdom is for the down and out, and the outcasts and the Gentile, and is far beyond the parameters of the Pharisees. And then we go to Peter's mother-in-law. So the Pharisees has, uh, had a very low regards to the woman. So the Pharisees used to get up and they said the same thing every morning. This was this uh, standard statement. I thank thee that I am not a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. So they believed that lepers and Gentiles and women were sorry up in the same category, that's the way they view women. So Jesus goes to the left, uh, lowest level of human need and the disease. And we go to the second set of miracles. So his power over the natural elements, the supernatural world, and, and sin. So, so in verse 23, Still in chapter 8. So verse 23 to 27, let us pray. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there, behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. So that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And, and they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? So. Remember that the most of, of the disciples were, were fishermen. And they get usual storms in, in, this, uh, in these waters. But in verse 24 says, And behold, there arose. The word behold is a statement of exclamation. In other words, this was a shocking or su surprising, unexpected, severe thing. So they had seen this, uh, these sailors had a lot of storms. They had been on that little lake in a lot of times when the wind was blown and so forth, but never had there anything like this. So this is a great storm that hit that little uh, little boat through those waters. And I believe those sailors uh, did everything possible to keep the boat afloat, and because this was their expertise. And realizing the futility of their efforts, they finally came to Jesus. So now, when sailors ask a former car carpenter what to do in a storm, you know, they, they are in big trouble. <laughs> so verse 26, Then he arose and rebuked the wind and sea, and there was a great calm. Instantly there was a great calm. Normally the wind stopped, uh, the sea would continue to ripple until the waves have, have run their course. But when Jesus said, Peace be still, the sea became as glass. There was a great calm according to, to Mark. 
as both the wind and the waves stop. So that's the power. We don't know the intensity of that wind in that kind of storm. And even more, if there was rain. But Jesus was able to stop that storm with a mere word. So Matthew's message to us is that the one who conquers disease also controls nature. In verse 27, and then men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. So the same Jesus Christ that still the sea is the one that keeps all those atoms moving in our body. And the one that keeps this earth whirling in space, the one that keeps this universe in balance. The same Jesus Christ will one day come and set up his eternal kingdom. The question will is will you be a part of that of that kingdom? So it is of course by faith. So we will continue to the second uh, miracles, the supernatural. So verse 28. And when he came to the to the other side, to the country of the Gatherings, two demon possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs were was feeding at the sun, at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, if you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned into the waters. The herdsmen fled and going to the city they told everything especially what, what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. So it is Matthew's concern as he writes this uh, marvelous gospel that we understand that Jesus, is, Jesus Christ is the King, the Messiah, the rightful ruler of the world, the King of the earth, the monarch of all monarchs and the Son of God, God in human flesh, God incarnate, the second member of the Trinity. <coughs> so in other words, it is the deity of Christ that we must see. Now one of the major factors in providing beyond doubt that Christ is, Christ is in fact, the Messiah, is, is to show that he has the power over the unseen forces the unseen forces of the uh, supernatural world, the demon house. If the Lord Jesus Christ is, in fact, to redeem the earth, if he is to reverse the curse, if he is to take the possession of fallen humanity, it must be that he can overcome or overpower that which is all, all of this in its control right now. And that, of course, is Satan and his demons. So our Lord came into the world to destroy the works of the evil and, ultimate, and ultimately when he establishes his kingdom, that is exactly what will happen. He will imprison Satan and all his demon, demon hosts for a thousand year millennium, at the end of which he will gather, gather them up to be eternally tormented. He has come to destroy permanently the works of the devil and in casting out uh, demons throughout his ministry, he was giving samples of this great uh, power. In fact, on one, uh, one occasion he said this, if I truly cast out demons, then the kingdom of God is come. He said that in Luke uh, chapter 11. So because one of the mark of the kingdom would be the overthrow of Satan. And he's saying, if you see me doing it, you know that the kingdom is come. So we come to the third uh, miracle from the second set. So Jesus heals them for a little. In chapter 9, verses uh, 1 to 8, that's right. 
And getting into a boat, he crossed over the, and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. That, but Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, You rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth and to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were, they were afraid and they glorified God. But given such authority to men. And now uh, Jesus goes even beyond of those miracles. And he shows that he has the power over the root of all man's misery, which is sin. He deals with human guilt and human pollution, the evil that separates man from his neighbor. And so the great uh, physician can not only heal sick, still the storm and deal with demons, but he can bring human human soul. He can bring to the human soul the things that it needs the most. So the forgiveness of sin. So this is another mark of the authority of Jesus Christ. And this is one of his uh, type of authority. We can call it a redemptive uh, authority. Uh, he has the authority to forgive sins. And all of these are ways in which Matthew marks out the authority of Jesus Christ. In the Sermon of the Mount, he showed us his authority over religion. In chapter 8, uh, uh, verse 1, his authority over this is chapter 8. In verse 23, his authority over nature. In chapter 8, verse 28 to 34, his authority over demons. And now, his authority over sins. So this is the remission of sins that the Bible talks about. This is salvation. This is forgiveness, full and complete. And sins are, are sent away, he says, dismiss. And when the Lord sends our sins away, he sends them as far as the east is from of the deepest sea. You can see that in Psalms 103. And the Bible says, he remembers them no more. And Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he said, I was a blasphemer and a per persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy, and this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So that is remission of sin, forgiveness of sins. So sin affects all men. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin is death, is deep in the heart of man. Even regenerate man still fight against sin. Sin dominates that mind. It perverts the will, it stains the, the affections. It pollutes the body. Sin brings man under the dom dominion of the devil. It brings man under the power of the wrath of God. So this is true of all men. But the good news we can give them is that God can forgive sin and he does forgive and this is the and this paralytic man is the it's a living proof as we discuss the first set of miracles which is disease the second set of miracles the natural the supernatural and sin <coughs> and we come to the third set and, and the last which is death so his power over death, in chapter 9, verse 18, to, to verse uh, 26. Let's read. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him, 
with his disciples, and behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the prince of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her, took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this, of this went through all the district. So Jesus' power over death. This is uh, what it's all about. The raising of one from the dead. And on the way of the healing of the woman with the issue of blood, uh, if you read the, gasp, uh, the other Gospels, you know that the reason of healing is uh, interlude is to delay Jesus until the little girl is, is totally dead and the funeral has already begun. For the other writers tell us that when first approached, the man said to Jesus, my daughter is dying. And by that time we got there, she was already dead and the, uh, the funeral was in session. So. I think this is to be an essential message dealing with the uh, critical theme. We are living in a dying world where all of us face the inability of death. We are deteriorating humans in a deteriorating world. Our world is marked by tragedy. Our world is marked by sorrow. Our world is marked by sadness. And our world is marked by death and dying. Since the, since the fall of man is recorded in Genesis chapter 3, there has been a curse on the earth, and that curse has sent the earth and all of its inhabitants careening and spiraling into tears and disasters and pain and sickness and death. So we can see it every day. So I saw in my eyes the the last breath of my, of my father in his deathbed. And I am the one who confirms that the remains of my mother-in-law was, was ours in mortuary in, in Morgue. So, ganang kalapag sa hospital. So, dadali ka sa Morgue, bubuksan sa iyo yung patay. Ikukonfirm mo na yun nga yung, yung patay niya bago ko yun yung, yung funeral parlor. So, even, even in the hospital, in the, in the ICU's uh, waiting, waiting room, there's one room, there's a couple of family uh, waiting there. So they, they are all waiting for the saddest, saddest news of losing someone. So maybe yung yung umuwi galing sa ICU na nabuhay. So even we heard from our friends or we witness ourselves uh, someone died in cancer, in accident, in war, and even in simple, in simple words. So God doesn't want, want it so. That wasn't the plan. All things in the world were created for the good of man and the blessing of man, but man sinned. And so the Old Testament prophet says, sin will run its course and then God will reverse the curse. God will turn it all around, and we can see it in the end of Revelation, the next to the last chapter. It reads, Behold, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor, ni nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. So John has this in incredible vision of the day when the curse is over. So who can do that? Who can reverse the curse? Who can destroy disease and pain and sorrow and tears and death? The prophet said there would come a Messiah. There would come a prince. There would come a king. And he would do it. He would have the power to bring back 
fullness to life. When Jesus came into the world, he demonstrated that power. Though the fulfillment of those prophecies is, is yet in the future, the one who fulfilled them has sufficiently demonstrated his ability to do so. So that when Jesus came into the world, for all intents and purposes, as we have seen, he banished disease, he raised the dead, he forgave sins. And all, all of those things that will be true of the great and glorious coming kingdom. He demonstrated there in his first coming. So the miracles of Jesus were the verification of his power to reverse the curse. The verification of his power to establish the kingdom. Now on this section, we have three miracles. Uh, the first one is after the miracles in the miracle, but there are three separate miracles. The first, raising the dead. The second, giving sight to the blind. And the third, speech to the dumb. Now the last, the last two uh, seems uh, less marvelous than the resurrection. And we may ask the question why, why Matthew would include uh, giving sight and giving speech in this section that speak of his power over death. So let, let's read on, on verse 27 from chapter 9. <clears throat> and verse 27, and, and as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. And when he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? They said, they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one know, knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that, through all that district. Verse 32. As they were going away, behold, a demon oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowd marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, They cast out demons by the prince of demons. So this is the most uh, beautiful analogies of salvation in Matthew's entire gospel. Their blindness becomes an analogy of spiritual blindness, being lost and blinded by sin. First of all, they had, they had a need. <coughs> they were blind and they, they knew that. That's where salvation begins. Nobody comes to God unless he sends a need. Unless he knows he cannot see, he's blind, he has no resources, he has no hope, he cannot discern the truth. So there is a sense of desperation. <clears throat> Need is then followed by knowledge. They found out who Jesus was and they knew that he was the deliverer, the Messiah, the son of David. Their, their knowledge was right. Out of their need came their knowledge. They're sought to know that they found the truth. And that's how salvation comes about. First, there's a deep need, and out of deep need comes a searching for the right answer. And then that is followed by the sense of sinfulness. They said, have mercy. We're not here to tell you we deserve anything. We're here to tell you we need something that we don't deserve. And that's how salvation is. You come with a cry of mercy. So first he raises the whole person from the dead and he shows how it is that he can raise her whom by showing how he can give life to the dead parts. He who can give sight to the dead eyes and give speech to the dead tongue can also raise the dead. For that's only the sum of the parts. And so he is the power that reaches his death. It's the power over, over the dead. <clears throat> so Jesus can can Jesus overcome death so this is the message uh, from G.B. Hardy 
the Canadian scientist one, one time, uh, he said, when I look at the religion, I said I have two questions. Question number one, has anybody ever conquered death? And question number two, if they did, did they, did they make a way for me to conquer it? So I said, I checked the tomb of Buddha, and it was occupied. And I checked the tomb of Confucius, and it was occupied. And I checked the tomb of Muhammad, and it was occupied. And I came to the tomb of Jesus, and it was empty. So I said, there's one who conquered them. And, asked, and I asked the second question, did he make a way for me to do it? And I opened the Bible, and, and he said, because I live, you shall live also. Now we can see this is uh, Matthew's message to us. He's the one who conquered disease. He's the one who can handle nature. And later, tell us that he's the one who controls the demons. And he is the one who forgives sins. He is the one who raises the dead. And think about it. He is the one who lives in your life. The same Christ who healed the sick, still the Sea of Galilee, and raised the dead, is the Christ who keeps every atom and every, every star in its orbit. He keeps the universe in balance and provides for each plant and animals. One day, he's coming to restore the world that sin defiled, to make completely new the new heaven and new earth. And even now, he is the God who gives eternal life to those who trust in him and who will come our every story and give strength for every suffering and tragedy. So therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every time confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you have been in store for us. Jesus, thank you for you, for what you have done. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving us. And this is all for your glory. Amen.